If we ask who is the most adored bear in the world, well, you probably know the answer. If, however, we add Canadian expat bear, you'll no doubt come up with the answer. It's Winnie the Pooh, of course. The Royal Ontario Museum opened an exhibit earlier this year featuring the ursine character created by A.A. A. Milne. And while it's under lockdown with the rest of the provincial capital right now, there's still lots to talk about and to see online. With us to get that started, we welcome Lindsay Maddock, the great granddaughter of Captain Harry Colburn, who's the Canadian veterinarian who once donated a bear cub named Winnie to the London Zoo. She's the author of Finding Winnie and co-author of Winnie's Great War. And we welcome Justin Jennings. He's the archaeologist and senior curator in the Royal Ontario Museum's Department of Art and Culture. And it's a great pleasure to have you two here with us tonight on TVO to talk about something. Well, it's not often we talk about something that everybody knows, but I think this is one of those occasions where we're going to talk about something that everybody knows. Lindsay, your family's ties go uh, way back with Winnie the Pooh. It was, it was more than 100 years ago, right? August 24th, 1914, your great-grandfather wrote in his diary, left Port Arthur, 7 a.m., on train, bought bear, $20. <laughs> What's the backstory to all of that? <laughs> he did write that uh, over 100 years ago. So he, my great-grandfather was a veterinarian when the first, he lived in Winnipeg, and when the First World War broke out, he enlisted with a Winnipeg regiment, uh, got on the train, traveled through White River, Ontario, got off, met a hunter. He was selling a bear cub. He bought it for $20 as a mascot for his regiment, named it Winnie, uh, short for Winnipeg, to sort of remind his, I think, fellow soldiers of where, of their hometown. Got back on the train and then basically tra trained Winnie, uh, traveled across the Atlantic, trained, uh, sorry, tra trained in Quebec at Valcartier, got, traveled across the Atlantic, trained in Salisbury Plain, and then about four months later, when he realized they had to go to the front lines and it was not going to be safe for a little bear, uh, he needed to find a new home. And the London Zoo was that new home. And of course, she had some very famous visitors uh, that came along the way, um, which ended up um, resulting in uh, the story that we all talk about now today, Winnie the Pooh. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I suspect a lot of people know that Winnie the Pooh was named after Winnipeg, but I didn't know it was after the regiment that your great-grandfather served in, that was the real connection to Winnipeg? So his, he was from Winnipeg. He was, he immigrated from, from, uh, from England, but lived in Winnipeg. And so when he, uh, when he named her, he chose the name Winnipeg after his hometown. But his, his regiment was a Fort, was the Fort Gary Horse, which was a Winnipeg-based regiment. Gotcha. How did, maybe Justin, you can pick up the story, because, because uh, Lindsay just told us that the bear eventually ended up at the London Zoo, but uh, fill in some of the blanks there. How did that happen? Well, you know, it's a weird thing because a lot of a lot of people say, well, why would you possibly pick up a bear on, their, on your way to war? Um, but mascots are pretty common. So when um, Harry Colburn and his, and his regiment stopped there, they picked up the bear. They went all the way, as uh, Lindsay said, across the Atlantic, Salisbury Plain, were doing all of their uh, training there. And, of course, he was faced with going into the trenches of World War One. You weren't allowed to bring in bring the bring the mascots into the into the war front. Most people uh, followed that, and actually a lot of uh, animals got donated to places like Toronto Zoo. I think there were five black bears donated during the war. So it wasn't just Winnie that went into the zoo. Lots of animals ended up sort of stopping England on their way to World War I, um, although a few people did smuggle uh, animals into the front. And there's famous stories, for example, you may know of Sergeant Billy, right, the World War I uh, goat that actually uh, saved three Canadian soldiers by pushing them into the trenches just as a a bomb was about to explode. But for the most part, uh, animals that got all the way to England, like Winnie, were left at the zoo uh, for the duration of the war for their safety. And Lindsay, did it never occur to your great-grandfather that this cute and cuddly little bear would someday grow up into presumably a very big and potentially nasty bear and he might not want to be around it? <laughs> you know, that's something that I've, I've thought about. My eight-year-old son likes specifically to ask me that question because, as we all know, Bears are wild animals, and no matter how well you train them, there's a distinct possibility that it's, you know, it's true na nature is going to come out. But I like to think that, you know, she did have a unique nature. Harry was, of course, a veterinarian. He was going overseas to look after the cavalry, so the horses. 
Um, and I like to think that he had a, a way with animals. And certainly Winnie had a particularly unique nature. The London Zoo, there was a zookeeper, Ernest Scales, at the London Zoo who wrote that Winnie was the only bear they ever trusted entirely, which I always thought was sort of a funny fact because I don't know if that implies they, they trusted the other bears, you know, partially. <laughs> um, but they never had an incident. She lived for 20 years, which is a very long time at the London Zoo. Um, and she was, you know, beloved by, by children uh, at the zoo. Well, she was beloved by children at the zoo and, of course, beloved by children and families outside the zoo. Once, once the story of Winnie became popularized by A.A. A. Milne, Alan Alexander Milne, and his son, Christopher. Justin, can you pick up the story there and tell us when did they come into the picture and, and therefore popularize this little bear? Yeah, sure. So that the uh, Chris Rum was born in 1920, about a year after he picks up that bear you saw in that picture. He called him Edward Bear or just Bear. And But a few years later, he started going a lot to the London Zoo. As Lindsay was saying, that Winnie was already a crowd favorite there. Uh, it was a bear, was a cute, cuddly bear. The bear loved kids. The, the bear loved treats. Um, the, the, actually, uh, A.M. was able to get his son in, and you'll see some famous pictures of, uh, of Christopher Robin sitting there inside the cage feeding uh, Winnie treats like condensed milk. So there was this very strong attachment. His attachment was so strong that a few years after getting that bear, he decided to change the name, Chris Robin, from Edward Bear to, to Winnie, or Winnie the Pooh. And that part of the Pooh part comes from a swan that he knew. Winnie comes from the... Uh, comes from the bear, and of course, you got to get into the mind of a four-year-old in, in order to understand why he chose that uh, that name. But he chose that name; it stuck. And then his father began to write stories to entertain his uh, his son. And those stories are the stories that we we see in the Winnie the Pooh uh, books. Okay, hit me with that again. I might have missed something there. The Pooh part sure. came from where? The Pooh. So he would. Well, there's a lot of stories here, you know. So first of all, the whole idea is probably the the the, the Winnie the Pooh thing is almost like. Uh, Alexander the Great. So it's sort of Winnie is the bear park. The is sort of, uh, you know, like an Alexander the Great kind of idea. And then Pooh was what he would call a swan that he would f uh, feed in the lake in London. So it was the Pooh swan. So once again, you've got to get into the head of a four year old and say, okay, how do four year olds think? He added all these together and came up with Winnie the Pooh. His father loved it. The name stuck. And then the books came out of. Uh, at Chris Robin's imagination, all the other uh, stuffies that he had in his nursery and all the adventures that he would have in the woods in their cottage that they bought uh, a few years after he was born. Gotcha. Lindsay, do you know whether your great-grandfather ever met A.A. A. Milne? He did not. So when the war ended, he I think he spent about a year in England, uh, in London, after the war, and then he moved back to Canada um, and he never he never returned to England. So and he he passed away in about 1947. So um, he never had a chance to um, to meet Milne. And it's it's a little bit difficult. That's the one piece of the story I think that's been hard for me as I've sort of pursued my family history to understand is how much awareness he had of the popularity of the Winnie the Pooh stories. Um, we know that he certainly knew they existed, but it was such a different time. Uh, and it's it's been sort of hard for me to get a full picture of exactly how much he understood just how you know popular the stories uh, became. Oh, that was going to be my follow up. Do you know whether he liked the books or was aware of the books or had read any of the books? I knew I know from my grandfather who who passed away when I was was younger, but from the conversations I had, he certainly um, he knew of the books. Um, he enjoyed them, but it. it it's a it's a strange sort of p missing piece of the story where you you would you would think there would have sort of felt like there was a bigger um, attention to it and even honestly with my grandfather um, the story was not well celebrated and well recognized in terms of the Canadian connection until well into the late eighties um, and that really came about almost by accident there was an article that came out. Um, that my grandfather um, was alerted to in the Calgary Herald saying that the bear had actually belonged to an Edmonton-based regiment. And he, of course, had all the diaries, all the photographs, and said, no, no, this was a, 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 a Winnipeg-based regiment, and it was my grandfather, you know, my father's bear. And it was named after Winnipeg. And so at that point in the 80s, the story sort of really blew up, and the, the, the origins of it were really celebrated. But as to exactly Harry's... Um, kind of full appreciation, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery still. Gotcha. 
Justin, how about Christopher Robin? How did he feel about the books? Well, he had mixed feelings about the books. You can imagine that as growing up, you know, the, the, the lead story is, you know, this little six-year-old running around named Christopher Robin. So, you know, he got bullied a little bit as he was growing up. He was always trying to sort of uh, get away from that name in some ways. Although, you know, at the same time, this was such a precious and important part of his his life that he looked back at it in fond memory. So he had a lot of mixed feelings about it. I think, you know, he never really, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't embrace the fame. He ended up as a, as a bookseller. He wasn't all that excited about, you know, people going up and wanting to talk to him about Winnie the Pooh and trying to get his autograph and things like that. But he still had, certainly had a sweet spot for the bear and a sweet spot for his father um, and the stories, of, you know. But but it was it was tough because, you know, he was living in the shadow of this little, this little tiny boy for the whole, rest of his life. Gotcha. Um, Justin, I want to ask you about the exhibit, you know, Winnie the Pooh exploring a classic, uh, which is at the Royal Ontario Museum. But I guess we should point out that this started overseas first. It was at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London first. And, and I'm going to guess that they probably did not hone in on the Canadian angle of this story as much as you are. So how important was it for you guys at the ROM to make sure the Canadian angle was more front and center? Yeah, the Victoria and Albert Museum, you know, they did an incredible job, but they were focused mainly on this idea of the story starts in London and then blows up from there. And there was one little tiny picture in the whole show that showed Chris and Robin Winnie at the London Zoo. And we said, well, hold on a second. You know, for our Canadian audience, and I remember as we were talking about doing this show, I would be routinely have someone come up to me and start telling me the Winnipeg story, you know, Winnie and the, and the bear and everything, and getting very excited about, about the show and making sure that I would talk about uh, Winnie uh, and, and that, that we'd have that as a big part of our show. So we rearranged the show in part in collaboration with Victoria and Albert so that we began the story not in 1920 London, but in 1914 when uh, Harry Colborn stops in White River and picks up Winnie. So we really try to emphasize that story for our visitors because, yeah, as Canadians, we feel that we have a big stake in the Winnie the Pooh story and wanted to tell that, that part of the story. Lindsay, you have written two books, Finding Winnie and Winnie's Great War. So, uh, I mean, I guess it's pretty obvious that you care a great deal about your family's unique role in the Winnie the Pooh story. Um, why has it captivated you so much? So I've been, I sort of always think of this story as um, this, it's a little bit of a magical story. Like if it didn't belong to my family, it would be the kind of story I would be captivated with no matter who it was connected to. Because I've always loved stories ever since I was a child. And I think that every so often when you hear a true story um, that is kind of as remarkable as a fictional story, it, it really resonates. And so I think ever since I've been a little kid, I was really captivated with the story. I remember my grandfather showing me the diary that you you know mentioned at the beginning where, of course, Harry made a notation about buying Winnie. And I just found it kind of kind of remarkable. And so along the way, you know, I did different things as a kid to sort of explore it. And I had a lot of questions. And I had this idea before my book, Finding Winnie, that one day I would have children myself. And at that point, I didn't have any kids. And that it would be a really amazing way to explain the story to my kids as a picture book. And so that was sort of the idea behind Finding Winnie. My son was um, only about a year old when the book came out. So it was a little bit lost on him. I now have a daughter who is three and she actually, um, it's been kind of amazing to sort of actually, because with my son, he was too young in a way, but with my daughter, she really is understanding this family history through the book where she went to the ROM and she literally walked around and said, there's my great, great grandfather. <laughs> and, uh, it was sort of a moment of, um, you know, a kind of a real dream coming true. So me. it will be important for you for the next generation down to take as much pride in this as you clearly have, yes? Absolutely. I've been planting those seeds already <laughs> with my kids <laughs> that one of them needs to pick up the torch here. So. And, and has, I mean, you're three generations removed from the you know, origin of this story. Has, has your grandfather's generation and your parents' generation been as captivated by this as you have been? So I would say my grandfather, uh, so Harry's only son, Fred, uh, Fred played a really pretty unique role in um, the story because he was a person who loved to do research. Um, he he really I sort of I often think of myself as sort of the 2.0 of 
telling this story because Fred did so much work in terms of, you know, making sure that the Canadian story was, of course, known, getting the statues built to commemorate the story in both uh, Winnipeg and the London Zoo. There was a Heritage Minute. There was a Canada Post stamp. So there was all these sort of foundational pieces that celebrated the story in Canada. And I feel like while most people, most Canadians know this story, when at the time that Finding Winnie came out and certainly Winnie's Great War, it's been really interesting to me to travel literally around the world at this point and share the story globally and to have people go, wow, there's a Canadian connection to this story. So um, I think that, you know, it's it's very important to um, to share it. And I think that, you know, my my mom and, my, and her sisters, I think definitely um, loved the story. But I just think that, you know, my grandfather had a specific sort of skill set and I loved to write. So um, I sort of took it in my own um, way to to celebrate it. Hmm. Justin, it seems impossible today to have a conversation without bringing COVID-19 into it, so we're going to do that now. What's COVID done to your exhibition? Uh, well, I mean, it's been uh, been heartbreaking, like a lot of things. We opened the, the show, uh, I think it was March 13th. Uh, within a week, of course, we were shut down for the first time, and then uh, we worked hard, like a lot of um, other businesses worked hard in order to, to do everything we could within the guidelines to get it all set up. We had a nice... Uh, uh, rerun the Victoria and Albert was kind enough to to let us extend the show so we opened it up for a little bit longer and of course uh, as you said in the opening we had to shut down again so we're optimistic that we'll be able to catch the last bit of it we're going to close January 17th and we're hoping we'll be able to get a few more people to see the uh, to, to go through the 100 acre wood and enjoy Winnie the Pooh but uh, yeah it's been difficult it's been a difficult time for the museum community in general and for sure January is it you can't get it extended no, we can't get it extended. It's got to go. And we were the very last stop. It was sort of a poetic thing where we thought that the, you know, the Canadian, uh, that Winnie the Pooh began in Canada, we were going to end the show in Canada. I was supposed to end, I believe it was in August. They were kind enough to let us extend it by about six months. But yeah, that's the end. So unfortunately, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if, if we can't open, we can't open. But, um, you know, we'll try to do what we can online and, and get people excited about the books again, because it is quite, quite a magical read. I mean, a lot of people know uh, Winnie the Pooh from Disney, but it's it's quite incredible just to look at the original uh, Milne and Shepherd stories from uh, from the 1920s. Well, Lindsay, I guess if you can't get to the Royal Ontario Museum, you can always go to Northern Ontario to White River, where they they kind of do a poo fest every year, don't they? They do. I, I personally haven't actually been to it, but I've been to the town of White River, and I've heard a lot of stories about the festival, and uh, it's it's amazing when you go through that town. It's it's, it's quite small, but they have really done a, an amazing job in terms of celebrating the connection to, to Winnie. And I've heard the festival is a lot of fun. And they had to do it virtually this year, I guess, like everything else, right? I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah they did. Justin, I gather there are Winnie the Pooh groupies out there. Do you know any and what are they like? Oh, sure. I mean, there's lots of folks that it's amazing. We open the show, of course, there's, there's lots of people from kids to a uh, to adults that are in their uh, Winnie the Pooh costumes or their Eeyore costumes walking through. So it felt a little bit like Comic-Con on occasion, uh, you know, as, as you had at least uh, some people really getting into the spirit. And, uh, you know, I've gotten lots of emails and, and uh, you know, phone calls or people who pulled me aside. And, and it's, it's really quite touching because they'll talk about how, you know, growing up that uh, how Winnie the Pooh changed their lives, sometimes as kids, sometimes as adults. I mean, so there's lots of people that feel really, really passionately about who and are so thankful for those stories and so so thankful for the exhibit uh, just to bring a little bit of sunshine into their lives during uh, these dark COVID days. I think, Lindsay, we really do have to hit on the head here why this thing is so popular and has been for so many years. Because after all, this is a story about a bear, which is, um, well, <laughs> Winnie the Pooh is very naive and very calm and very sweet. Um, the piglet is pretty neurotic. The tigger is pretty hyper. Eeyore is always very depressed. Uh, the rabbit is always very grumpy. What is it about this combination of characters that seems to have just caught on so hard over the years? Well, I think that having now had young children myself, there's there's just sort of an honesty in all those characters in the way they are. And I think there's something really universal about them. Most of us can, on some level, we all have an Eeyore, we all have a Piglet, um, we all have a Pooh in our lives who 
you just there's there's a, a a really sort of natural quality to I think the way um, Milne was able to bring those personality types to life, those contrasting personality types in a way that's really true and authentic. And I think there's something about little kids that they really they tell you the straight goods. Kids, they don't filter things. They uh, and I think that there's there's just a, a an honesty in those characters that that resonates. I think that the stories are at the end of the day they're about friendship, they're about adventure, um, they're about things that they're about imagining. And so I think that there's you know when you when you watch a child sort of take in the adventures that they had on there's a simplicity to them that I think really really resonates. And and one of the things I would add to that that, that I found just really interesting personally that I didn't know and that the exhibition kind of uh, enlightened me to is that um, when E.H. Shepard drew those characters um, and he was drawing them based on, of course, Christopher Robin's stuffed animals. And so the way the physicality of the stuffed animals looked, so a sort of p a piglet had this kind of, as a stuffed animal, had this kind of constant look of surprise and Eeyore looked sort of downtrodden. And so it was the, the sort of these worn, loved children stuffed animals that ended up creating these physical, the look of the animals ended up informing the personalities of the characters. And I thought that was just really fascinating um, as well. Justin, what would you add to that? Why do you think it works? Well, I mean, I think it works just because as you said, it's that, as she said, it's that great honesty, the great sense of, hey, look, you know, um, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel grumpy. It's okay to have these big feelings that are overwhelming. And it's okay to to reach out to other people. I mean, I I um, we we get the honor of when we do these shows to have a little curatorial statement at the beginning. And I I um, quoted in mind the end of uh, the House of Proof Order that if anyone's read the end of that book, you you can't help crying. It's uh, you know Chris Robin saying goodbye to Hunter Edgar Wood. He reaches up, uh, he reaches down his hand. Winnie the Pooh uh, reaches reaches up his paw. And they sort of hold on to each other and just hold on for dear life because they know that moment's over, you know, of, of childhood. So there is just these these incredible uh, uh, things that you see in those books that's amazing that when you read them, you know, when you're a kid, you read them now as an adult, you read them when you have grandkids, it's always different. It really just strikes you because that those emotions are so raw and so real. So that's why I think it just has that that power across, you know, more than a century now. Uh, well, I should say, well, the, the, the books are a little bit less than a century, but almost a century now. Um, it just works because it, it gets right at, at those human feelings. Full confession time, Justin. Which character do you identify with the most? Oh, I mean, it depends. Uh, it depends on the on where I am right now. Sometimes, uh, you know, Piglet, I'm a little, little bit terrified, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, so I think that... Uh, you know, sometimes I'm an ER, you know, it just depends as, as I go along. And I'll, you know, sometimes I have that false confidence. So uh, I, I always I think what you do is you look at all those different characters and you say, okay, what am I right now? It's okay to be that right now. And then you try to sort of maybe push yourself away from that cliff about too, being too Eeyore, being too Piglet, or too, being too Rabbit or what happened. Lindsay, you don't get off the hook from this question either. Which one do you, <laughs> which one do you identify with the most? I think my friends would say I'm a bit Tigger-like. I'm sort of bouncing around all the time, but I, I think on some level I'm constantly trying to be, to find my inner poo and, uh, you know, just kind of be a little more zen and present and, and all those wonderful things that the poo is. But uh, the truth is I'm, I'm a bit Tigger. <laughs> <laughs> we all need a bit more Winnie the Pooh in us these days, don't we? Given the times in which we live, it would be good to be a little bit more chill with the world, right? Fair to say? It's totally fair to say. Yeah. Uh, how about this? We've got a few minutes left here, and I wouldn't mind getting into some, I don't know, call them what you will, fun facts or th things about Winnie the Pooh that maybe people don't know but you want to lay on us now. Justin, you want to start? Well, I, I think the, the, the biggest fun fact that... Uh, Thanks for calling on me first, so then it becomes a little easier for me. But the the first the first fun fact, of course, is that Winnie was a girl, right? So one of the big things that uh, that people like to talk about is you know Winnie was a a uh, you know a female bear, uh, and then for whatever reason, it's never quite clear, um, but that uh, Winnie the Pooh becomes a boy bear by the time that uh, that it's written about. So that's one fun fact for you. Great, Lindsay. That's going to be a tough one to match, but I bet you can do it. <laughs> It's a good one. Um, the one fun fact I would add, when Justin was talking earlier about how uh, Winnie the Pooh got its, uh, became Winnie the Pooh, and we know the Winnie part, we know the the part, and the Pooh was the, was the swan, but the, the reason that I've heard is because the, the swan would shed its feathers, 
and when the feathers would land on Christopher Robin's sleeve, the sound he would make to he would blow off the feathers from his sleeve, and the sound that would it would come out was poo poo, uh, blowing the feathers out. So that's mm. the way I've heard the poo part coming into play, which is kind of fun. That is cool, and that of course makes perfect sense. Well, I want to thank both of you for coming on a TVO tonight and telling us all about this. Justin, our fingers are really, fingers and toes crossed that we get those doors to the ROM open at some point so that we can all see this exhibit. And Lindsay Maddock, it's so good of you not only to write the books and keep the legacy going, but to join us here tonight and share all of your great wisdom. Lindsay Maddock, Justin Jennings, thanks so much to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.